Hello and welcome to Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Have you all noticed in recent years that sloths are plastered on everything? You can buy sloth t-shirts, backpacks, and knickknacks, and wall decor. The BBC showed clips of sloths swimming island to island in search of a mate, and people travel to far-off destinations to hopefully see a sloth in the wild. While being a charismatic species can have its perks, there can also be some serious ramifications. We have to ask, what threats are sloths currently facing, and how can we help keep these slow-mo mammals around? In this episode, I'm chatting with Sam Troll, the co-founder of the Sloth Institute in Manuel Antonio, Costa Rica, and author of Sloth Love. Sam first fell in love with lemurs as a young girl, but after working at the Duke Lemur Center for 12 years and experiencing some life turmoil, she realized that working with animals in captivity was no longer fulfilling. She began traveling and worked in primate conservation around the world. After teaching a primate course and taking a job as a vet tech in Costa Rica, she discovered her absolute love of sloths and knew she needed to find a way to rescue, rehabilitate, and release sloths. Her pursuits led to the founding of the Sloth Institute. Sam and I had a passionate conversation about all of the threats sloths are facing, plus how any of us around the world can help these highly adapted, super cute creatures. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe and rate and review the show wherever you're listening. The more people that find the show, the more impact we can create as our freaking awesome Rewildology community. All right, everyone, on to my conversation with Sam. Awesome, Sam. Thank you so much for coming on Rewildology today. I cannot wait to get into the story and the beautiful little creature you have is your Zoom background right now. Oh, yeah, have so much fun. But before we get to all of that, when we were chatting, you have such an interesting and winding story. How in the world did you get to Costa Rica? What was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? Like, let's, let's explore everything to get to today. Okay. Well, I grew up in Durham, North Carolina, and I mean, a pretty normal childhood, I think back when you could walk to elementary school. And <laughs> I, I've always loved animals. I remember as a kid, not just loving animals, but loving trees and like being super into planting acorns and getting really excited every time a sapling would grow and just really being kind of in touch with nature. Like I always remember like caring about every single little creature, you know, grasshoppers, spiders, like all that kind of stuff. As a kid, you know, I didn't want to hurt anyone. So definitely always cared about animals. And then, and I've always loved science. Science and math have always been like my favorite things. And so when I was 16, I did an internship at the Duke Lemur Center, which is at Duke University, which is of course in Durham. And that was when I fell in love with lemurs. And I ended up staying at the Duke Lemur Center for about 12 years. And I have a bit of an obsessive personality. So <laughs> usually when I love an animal or a species, like I'm super full on about that species and just, you know, want to do everything to protect them. And so I was obsessed with eye eyes. I mean, you know, all the different lemur species are super cool. Like cockerel shafox are also one of my favorites, but there's just something about eye eyes that really drew me in. And I think part of that is one reason why I love sloths now is just their uniqueness and the fact that in a lot of ways they're kind of underdogs <laughs> contrary to how most people feel about sloths a lot of people don't think eye eyes are very attractive completely disagree i think they're adorable <laughs> and super cute but some people think you know, they're creepy. it has been it has been mentioned that some people think they're creepy i mean i don't know who these crazy people are but that's clearly not my opinion of eye eyes but just the fact that they're you know is a strong opinion about the way that they look. It's kind of, that's kind of similar with sloths, but in the opposite direction. But anyway, so yeah, I was obsessed with eye eyes and, and, and well, all lemurs. But there was always a part of me while working with animals in captivity that just like at the end of the day, like I had, a, I found it really hard to go home at night because I always felt like I wasn't doing enough for them. Not because 
of, you know, my quality of work or, or the place like the Duke Lamer center is a really great place and takes really good care of the animals. But it just like always bothered me that, you know, at the end of the day, they were still in a cage and they didn't have, you know, as much space as they wanted to roam and all that. And so it just always felt like I couldn't ever provide enough enrichment or, or do everything possible. And I just really wanted to get into like conservation actually in the field versus, you know, XC2 conservation. I was really interested in getting into NC2 conservation. And so I actually did go to Madagascar for the first time with the Duke Lamer Center for a project to, to look for IIs in um, one of the forests that they worked in there. And that was amazing. And that was really great. Sadly, I had to come home early because my father was passing away. Mm. So that, of course, you know, abruptly finished, like ruined, or I would say abruptly stopped that dream. And then after losing him and other losses in my life, I just felt like I needed to like make big changes. Like, I guess, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of people feel that way after there's like big changes in your life. Like, yeah, maybe you need some more changes to... <laughs> to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So then I went to work in Nigeria for a while and I explored West Africa in total for about a year. What was uh, in Nigeria? It, so in, so, so another thing, like I mentioned, like I was always kind of interested in working with animals in the wild, but also just the idea of rehabilitating animals and then getting them back to the wild was kind of like the ultimate, like, oh my God, could anything be cooler? Could anything be better <laughs> than that? Mm -hmm. Like I was only thinking of the good side clearly then I know all the sides now, but that definitely was kind of like the pinnacle of helping an animal, like to be able to not only alleviate whatever pain or stress they were going through, but get them back to where they were genuinely supposed to be just seems like the ultimate way to help an animal. So, so I went to Nigeria to work or to volunteer in primate rehabilitation. And so that was a good experience. But then, like I said, then I traveled around West Africa for a while and eventually came back to North Carolina and was kind of like, okay, well, now what? Like, what's the next, you know, experience I can have? And by then I was really into photography and kind of beefing up my portfolio. So I did do some photography work in North Carolina, like actually with humans, <laughs> photographing humans, babies and families and things like that, which is... It, which is for, you know, for a non-animal career, it's, that's pretty fun. Like I definitely enjoy all kinds of photography. And so working with humans to take their pictures is, is actually really cool. And I do enjoy that. But of course there's a part of me that, you know, just has to be with non-human animals. And I really, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then I took a job with a company called Broadreach Academics, where there's a lot of different companies like this, but basically you, or they take like high school and college students to different places around the world to study different topics. And the topic that I was teaching was primate studies, because obviously primates was my background before sloths. Well, it's still my background, but it was my only background before sloths. And so that took me to Costa Rica and Panama for the first time. And it's funny because before that, I had always seen myself as someone who just wanted to work in Africa. It didn't even necessarily matter which country in Africa, but I just love, you know, all the different animals that can be found in Africa and in Madagascar just always seemed like the most exciting different species for me. And I never really thought about Central America or South America as being an exciting places to work. But then of course I came to Costa Rica and Panama for the first time and I was like, whoa, okay, actually like this is really cool. And Costa Rica in general is, I mean, it's gorgeous. And it's for the most part, in especially in comparison to other countries like Madagascar, much more well preserved from a forest standpoint. And, you know, working in Madagascar, I mean, the lemurs are amazing and the people are amazing and it's such a cool country and I really love it. But there is, you know, such a large amount of deforestation that it can feel overwhelming and so coming to Costa Rica and seeing everything so green all the time, like you drive down the road and you see green, whereas in Madagascar, you drive down the road and you don't see green again until you get to the next, next patch of forest. Like it's all mm. just bare, 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 no trees until you get to the next patch of trees. Whereas in Costa Rica, you drive down the road and you, you pretty much see trees the whole time. 
Not to say there isn't a deforestation problem here. There definitely is, but it's just kind of a different uh, level, different scale than it is in Madagascar. So anyway, so I really appreciated that. And, you know, the culture here is just, it's very Pura Vida, which is, you know, like the typical thing that people like to say here. And it is really true. Like people are in general laid back and super nice. And I mean, it's just gorgeous. And then of course the animals are amazing. Yeah. And then eventually I met my first sloth. And then that's where the next chapter of my life started. Hmm, well, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep diving. <laughs> let's, let's, okay. just, let's go down this path. Okay. We're officially to Costa Rica. You met your first sloth. Mm-hmm. How did you meet your first sloth? Was it with this program that you were doing or was it in like a rehab rescue type place or what's the next phase that sparked this new love for you? Mm-hmm. Well, so actually I didn't meet a sloth the first time I came to Costa Rica. I still didn't really know that much about them that time. Again, it was, it was a primate studies course. So I was really focused on primates. However, I, we visited a rescue center during the, the course of the program that once I came back to North Carolina, I then was offered a position to come back and work at that rescue center as their vet tech and help run the, the wildlife clinic. And that was when I met my first sloth. Um, she was a baby two fingered. And I remember they like basically handed her to me and they were just like, none of the baby sloths ever survived. Just figure out a way to keep her alive. You know, do whatever you need to do to keep her alive. So I was like, all right. And tried to do what research I could on sloths though, especially back then, because that was almost nine years ago now, there really wasn't a lot of research on sloths. There's been a little bit more now, but even still, you know, it's nothing in comparison to, you know, how much research has been done on certain primate species. So there wasn't a ton, but obviously, you know, I was learning what they ate. For example, I wasn't told that they were nocturnal. So I had to kind of figure out that she was nocturnal. And so, you know, this is why she's sleeping all day, not because (laughs) they actually are that lazy, but because she was nocturnal. So it was the nighttime she was waking up meaning she's going to eat better at night. So then that's when you should feed more of the food and different things like that. So just kind of figuring out the best way to keep this baby alive. And then the next baby survived and then the next baby survived. And so then it came to a point of, well, now what do I do with them? You know, the babies have survived, but how do I then release them back into the wild? Because again, there wasn't any research on how to release hand-raised orphan sloths back into the wild. And if you asked certain people about it, they might say that it's not possible and that hand-raised orphan sloth shouldn't be released back into the wild. So there was that narrative previously in Costa Rica about hand-raised orphan sloths. But for me, I just was not okay with that because, Mm. you know, from a selfish perspective, there's a lot of work that goes into raising orphaned wildlife and, you know, what's the point if you're just going to leave them in a cage afterwards and basically subscribe them to not the ideal life for like, right. the rest? like I just couldn't live with myself just like giving up at that point and leaving them in a cage. Like it doesn't feel like the job is done until you release them. So, but then the, the question was, okay, well, how do you do it? Because obviously I very much cared about these animals at this point, you know, they felt, not to anthropomorphize, but it felt like they were like my children, especially since I don't have human children. I have, mm-hmm. I have dogs, but you know, I don't have human kids. And so raising a baby, especially one that is so like, does require a lot of maternal investment because sloths, three fingers sloths, they stay with their mom for up to about six months and two fingers sloths stay with their moms for almost a year. Wow. And that whole time, you know, the mom is carrying them around and taking care of them. And so there's a lot of maternal investment that goes on and there is a strong bond between mom and baby. So of course, when raising them, you do feel some of that. And so I think that, you know, for some people that bond might make them want to keep them and keep them in a cage and like keep them safe. But for me, it was the opposite because keeping them in a cage isn't keeping them safe. It, in fact, I mean, sloths don't even do well in captivity, but the stress and the diet and everything isn't ideal. But anyway, so basically I just was determined that there had to be a way to release them, but because it was so complicated and there wasn't a lot known about how to do it, and I did want to do a soft release system to make sure that they had some assistance as they were going back into the wild, that was when I realized that 
it wasn't going to be just like a simple little project. And that was when I met my co-founder of the Sloth Institute. Her name's Sada. And us meeting was really fortunate because she is like an entrepreneurial guru. Like she, you know, that's her thing. Like she knows how to start things and start businesses and, you know, just like the ultimate savvy, smart, strong woman. And I don't know anything about starting a business, but I knew a lot about animals. And at this point, you know, knew a lot about sloths, definitely knew a lot about those sloths, knew a lot about how I wanted to try to do things. And so, yeah, we basically just teamed up, started the Sloth Institute. And it started as a way to figure out how to release hand-raised orphan sloths and document the whole journey so that we could continue to replicate it ourselves and also teach other people how to do it. But it's since then become even more. We're not just a release program anymore. We also, you know, rescue rehab ourselves and, you know, work to try and preserve what forest is left, help reconnect the forest through our Speedway program. We work really closely with the firefighters and the electric department to try and help prevent electrocutions from happening, which is one of the main injuries that adult sloths face in Manuel Antonio in Costa Rica and other places in Costa Rica too. And then of course, educating people is huge and, and it has to be educating all different kinds of people because, you know, no matter where you live, you have the potential to affect the lives of wildlife, including sloths. So. Wow. That is so incredible. That I would sums love to it go, up. Yeah. I would love to go back <laughs> a second because obviously meeting your co-founder was such a pivotal moment in all of your story coming together. How did you meet her? And what do you think that she saw? If she's like this business guru, like, did, does she also have a passion for sloths? Or what does she see in you that's like, yes, I want to partner with Sam. I want to see this project go forward. I would love to talk about that moment a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That's, well, that might be a really good question for her about what she saw in me. But yeah. <laughs> she did definitely have a love for sloths already. She actually owns a villa in Costa Rica in Manuel Antonio, and it's called Villa Perisoso, and Perisoso is sloth in Spanish. Mm. So she already had a love of sloths. And I remember her telling me about when she built her villa, she, they, they redesigned where they were going to put a certain part of the villa just to not cut down one guarumo tree. That was a really important, guarumo trees are really important trees to sloths. And she completely redesigned her villa to make sure that that tree wasn't cut down because she knew sloths use that tree. So she definitely, you know, already had a love of sloths, a love of animals in general, like she loves dogs and a love of nature and trying to preserve nature. And then I think we met, well, we met in Mail Antonio and I just like started telling her, like, you know, she was just asking me questions about the sloths and what, what was my plan for releasing them? I mean, kind of like, just like normal questions someone would ask when they, you know, when you talk about what you do and everything. And, you know, I mentioned how, you know, I wanted to try and do this whole release program that had never been done before with tracking the sloths after we released them back into the wild and a whole soft release. So we, we put tracking collars around their necks and, you know, have people looking for them in the forest day and night. And, you know, I just kind of described this whole idea to her and she was basically like, wow, this is really great. This is like right up my alley. You know, I'll help you. Like, I mean, it was really serendipitous, I guess. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, she just happened to be, we just happened to, you know, both be in the right place at the right time with similar desires, but completely different skill sets to be able to come together and create what was, what was needed to help the sloths in Mel Antonio. Perfect partnership. It's both taking both of your really strong skills and being like, I got this to offer, you got that to offer. Let's make this happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it was it was really, it was really ideal. And for sure, I mean, like I said, I didn't know anything about starting a nonprofit, which I mean, she hadn't started a nonprofit either, but starting a business and starting a nonprofit business is similar you know, yeah. except all the, pro all the proceeds or all the, you know, money that you generate goes into the business rather than, you know, to make money for yourself. But it is like, I would say a similar skill set. And so luckily, you know, she had those skills. 
Mm. Sounds like she was the perfect person that you needed to meet <laughs> at that moment. Yeah. Like, I have this idea. How in the world do I make this happen? And she's like, girl, I got you. She sounds yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, she is awesome. Yeah, she she since retired and, and pretty much moved back to the U.S. now. She does come to visit Costa Rica from time to time. And of course, we, you know, still see each other. But I do miss her. Mm. She's pretty awesome. Also, she's American as well. She's American, yep. Oh, nice, nice. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. I had never yeah. asked. I just assumed she was Costa Rican. So that's really <laughs> cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> great, great. And also too, before we dive too much deeper, I just want to take a moment to chat about slaws themselves. Since yep. again, people probably don't know much about like the natural history and what these creatures actually are. Just right, right now, they're just really hip and they're cute and their faces are plastered on a whole bunch of different paraphernalia of things like so my you, background <laughs> yeah well i mean come on that is the cutest background <laughs> that's of all my time. picture so oh i'm allowed gosh. to put it there <laughs> i just like want to just mm, so cute it's so cute but super yeah, cute so cute but if you could just take a second just just explain a little bit more about slaws and even just whatever facts you want to list off but just educate mm -hmm. us about these amazing creatures yeah so well i think one of the first things to point out is that the two different kinds of sloths are not closely related. So the two-fingered sloths and the three-fingered sloths, and I say two-fingered and three-fingered versus two-toed and three-toed because it's much more accurate. They, the difference in the number of digits is on their fingers, not on their toes. And they also, like, unlike a dog, for example, that has four legs, sloths don't have four legs. They have two legs and they have two arms and they use them that way similar to a primate, you know, they don't eat with their feet. They eat with, I mean, some primates do actually eat with their feet, but <laughs> in general, you know, just like us, like we use our hands and our feet differently. So sloths are the same in that way. So just to start with two fingered and three fingered. And I feel like it's much more respectable to call them that way, because when you call them two toed or three toed, it's like ignoring the fact that they use their hands this like in a similar way that we do kind of just like lumping them in with less evolved animals. No. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, yeah. So two fingered and three fingered and the, so the two different kind. there's six species total that is currently recognized by science in the world. And they're only found in central and South America in the wild. And in Costa Rica, there's two different species. So there's the, Colepis hoffmani, which is the two-fingered species in Costa Rica, and Bradypus variegatus, which is the three-fingered species in Costa Rica. And the two different kinds have been evolving separately, they think, for probably about 40 million years. And so what that means is the similarities that we see are not based on a common ancestor. They're based on convergent evolution, which actually oh, makes cool. sloths the most extreme example of convergent evolution in mammals, which is pretty cool. Whoa. And so that is so they do, cool. <laughs> it's super cool. And so they do have a lot of similarities, but they do also have a ton of differences. And some of so like some of those differences would be so for example, actually this is my favorite fact about sloths, but the number of cervical vertebrae that they have is different. So as you may know, all mammals have seven cervical vertebrae except for manatees and sloths. And manatees have six, but they always have six. And with sloths, with two-fingered sloths, they can have between five and seven. What? And with three-fingered, yeah. With three-fingered <laughs> sloths, they can have between eight and 10. What? So that, so that <laughs> means that three-fingered sloths have more bones in their neck than a giraffe, which oh I just gosh. think is crazy cool. So is that how they can like do that whole like turn around with their neck? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. And one of the things I always like to tell people when I start explaining like all the, the weird things that there are about sloths is that for the most part, most of the, the unique morphological characteristics that they have and the unique behaviors that they have, most of those things can be explained by either their need to conserve energy or their need to be invisible in the forest because that's how they survive. They survive by not wasting energy and they survive by not, you know, getting eaten by predators because unfortunately they don't have a lot of ways to protect themselves from predators except for going unnoticed. So they need to basically be invisible. So by being slow, they're not only slowly conserving energy, but they're also 
silent. And we definitely see this in, you know, the thousands and thousands of hours that we've been observing sloths in the forest. When they're moving, you barely hear them. So like you need to have a visual and you need to keep that visual or you're going to lose your visual mm-hmm. because, <laughs> because they're so silent. And so with the cervical vertebrae question, with the three finger sloths, it really helps them to, you know, turn and look and maybe check out, you know, some noise behind them to see if it's a noise they should be worried about without moving their whole body. And by not moving their whole body, what do they do? They conserve energy and they bring less attention to themselves because they're moving, you know, a much smaller piece. So for the most part, most of the things that's weird about them can be explained with those, with those two things in mind, which I think is pretty cool. They are also excellent swimmers. Both kinds of sloths are excellent swimmers. There's a, a really ugly rumor going around that two-fingered sloths can't swim. And it's not true. And I don't know where it started, but it's not true. Both two-fingered and three-fingered sloths are excellent, excellent swimmers. And again, that makes a lot of sense because all the places where sloths live, there are bodies of water. In Mount Antonio, for example, there's the ocean and there have mm-hmm. been sloths found like floating on driftwood in the ocean. So being able to <laughs> swim, of course, helps keep them alive out there, though I don't think they're any match for really aggressive waves. But still, you know, being able to float, being able to swim is really important. And then you know, of course, rivers and, you know, sloths are found all through the Amazon, of course. So in places like that, I mean, the rivers just flood really easily with, with heavy rains. So being able to swim is essential for not drowning in a place where there's a lot of water that you could fall into. But also if you think about it, you know, rivers are like the roads of the natural roads of the forest. It's what separates different parts of the forest from another. And so by being able to swim, they're able to get from one side of the forest to the other to get to whatever things that they need. And also to get there with, you know, using less energy because they use a lot less energy swimming than crawling on the ground. So the fact that they're good swimmers, I think is pretty cool. What other facts do I love about sloths? Why do they come to the ground? And when do they do that? Oh man, that is literally every ecologist's favorite question. And... I mean, it's totally cool that you asked it, but I have to say, it's like, oh my God, do people like obsess about something else, please? Because people are so <laughs> obsessed with why they come to the ground. And honestly, I think the reason why people are so obsessed with why sloths come to the ground is because they erroneously assume it's more dangerous on the ground for a sloth than it is mm. in the tree. But that's never been proven. It's just this assumption that people keep this, it, keep in the narrative to make keep it asking drama. the question of why would they come on the ground? But honestly, I think they come to the ground because it is safer to come down to the ground than it is to stay up in the trees to go to the bathroom. So the reason, the main reason why they come down to the ground is to go to the bathroom and sloths, as you've probably heard, can hold their urine and feces for about a week. They don't have to hold it for that long. They don't usually hold it that long in captivity if they're well hydrated and and eating enough food, but in the wild, they can hold it that long. And so by the time, you know, it's been a week and you haven't gone to the bathroom, as you can imagine, they've stored up quite a lot of material and they can actually lose up to 30% of their body weight every time they go to the bathroom. Wow. Which is super cool. I totally wish I could do that. You know, that's a download. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Before this zoom, I've just been like, well, I just need to go to the bathroom. All right. Like look so much better for the zoom call. Yeah. (laughs) Fit into that party dress. But (laughs) sadly, even though I work with sloths, I have not been able to adapt that superpower. (laughs) But yeah, so it's a lot of fluid and material that comes out every time they go to the bathroom. So if you can imagine doing that up from the treetops would be extremely loud. And every and even even if they were doing it every day is still loud. For example, every time I hear a troop of howler monkeys above, they love to go to the bathroom in unison for for some reason. But I mean, you hear, you know exactly where that monkey is in the forest. Even me with my limited human hearing knows exactly where that monkey is just by listening to them, you know, urinate and defecate from the treetops. So Mm. I know an ocelot or a bird of prey is going to know exactly the location of that sound if they go from the treetops. However, by coming down from the top of the tree to the ground, you don't hear anything. Like it's super silent and they go peacefully and quietly, very slowly down the tree, do their business and then come back up. So the only negative to coming down to the ground is that it does use some more energy because obviously 
coming down the tree rather than staying up at the tree is going to use more energy. But if you're going to use more energy for something, there's no better reason than to not get eaten because, well, right. that's the end. <laughs> don't need to conserve any more energy because I don't need it anymore. <laughs> so I think that that's why they come down to the ground to go to the bathroom. There have been other theories, but there was one that was actually described by some really good scientists, but not necessarily sloth experts that said that the reason why they came down to the ground was because of mutualism between sloths, sloth moths, and the algae in their hair. Because sloth moths do lay their eggs in the feces of the sloths. And I don't know if you're familiar with sloth moths, but it's the species of sloth, I mean, the species of moth <laughs> that lives only in sloth hair. And it is pretty cool. Sometimes it looks really annoying for the sloths because they'll be all on their face. And they can, they can have like hundreds on them at a time. They usually have less. I mean, it, it really varies. Uh, sometimes they have none, but they can have a ton of, of sloth moths on them at once, and they're only found on sloths. So this theory was that the reason why they come down to the ground is so that sloth moths can lay their egg in their poop. And the reason why the sloth moths are important to the sloth is because when they die or when they, you know, get certain things in their hair, they, or poop, like poop in their hair, it helps the algae to grow in their hair. And then the reason why the algae is important to sloth, they hypothesize, is that the sloths were eating the algae off of their hair and using it for nutrients. And so that secret solve, like that's why they come down to the ground to poop. The problem with that is literally in what, like 7,000 hours we've been watching sloths, like literally observing them scientifically, like never once have we ever seen them lick their hair the way a cat does. Like they don't mm. do that at mm -hmm. all, not mm -hmm. once. They, they might eat algae, like they eat random things off of tree bark and, you know, different plants. And of course, the algae is going to be in the environment around them. I mean, where do we think it comes from? So they might be eating that algae, but they're not eating it off themselves. So that kind of, you know, negates that theory of why they come down to the ground. And it's also possible they come down to the ground for multiple reasons. Like, why does it even have to be one thing? Right. I think I personally, I think the most important thing is they don't want to die, but there could be multiple reasons why. Mm, yeah, that makes total sense. And hopefully that answers everybody's question for that exact mm -hmm. reason. <laughs> so I was like, I have mm -hmm. to ask it. I have to ask it. But that that is. Yeah, no, totally. That's a great. Yeah. Great response. Great answer. And then from like an evolutionary history standpoint, what is like their closest relatives? Where, where are they placed in the tree of life? This very special, unique creature. Mm -hmm. So they're in a suborder of uh, mammals called xenarthrins. And the other xenarthrins that exist are anteaters and armadillos. And so those are technically their closest living relatives, both you know, I have to say there's something special about xenarthrins in general because anteaters and armadillos are both like really fun species to rehabilitate. Like they're characters, total, doof <laughs> really? total doofuses, <laughs> like total idiots. I adore them. <laughs> um, they're so funny. And so, and sloths have similar characteristics to that. So I guess like being a doofus is a part of being as an arthrin. I don't know, but they're <laughs> amazing. I, I love them. I love them both. So yeah, they're their closest relatives. And actually the, the classification used to be called Egentata because, which means having no teeth because anteaters have no teeth at all. And then sloths have interesting dentition. That's another thing that's interesting about them. So they have no incisors at all, like no teeth up here and only molars and premolars. And so three fingered sloths only have little tiny nubby molars and premolars that continuously grow so that they can chew, you know, the leaves and on all the tough things that they chew on a regular basis to feed themselves. And then two finger sloths have the molars and premolars. And then they have these pseudo canines, which are really big, like typical canine looking canines, but they're not technically canines because they're positioned a little bit further back. So they're technically premolars. They call them pseudo canines, but they are big, sharp teeth. And a lot of people ask, well, like if they're vegetarians, why do they need big, sharp teeth? But I mean, Biting into mangoes and different hard seeds, like you do need some decent teeth to get into like really hard flesh. And they will eat, like especially the two-fingers do eat a bit of fruit in the wild. But also, as peaceful as I say sloths are, and as much as they do generally mind their own business in the wild, which is one of my favorite things about them, <laughs> they don't shy down from a fight with another sloth if they need to. 
and two finger sloths especially can be quite aggressive with one another with, with one another especially if they're like defending territory or you know if it's two males defending wanting to go out on a date with a young lady sloth so they will you know use those teeth to bite each mm. other and they have extremely strong jaws you well know, that makes sense all that chewing <laughs> yeah they can chew through rock and we've actually we had a volunteer who was trying to rescue help rescue a sloth off a wire and she got bit and it broke her finger whoa she had to have surgery yeah Damn. sloth bites are no joke sloth bites are no <laughs> joke i mean like i said they can break bone L legit can break bone but also they they don't have the cleanest mouths ever they have mm. you know they have a nice healthy community of bacteria in their mouths in and throughout their intestinal system you know to break down all the cellulose and the things that they eat so it's natural and it's good for them but it's not so good for when you get bit so you have to be super careful for it not to get infected and i have colleagues that you know she got bit in her arm and had to have parts of it surgically removed because wow. the infection got so bad so it's it's good not to touch sloths not only just for the sloth but also for yourself to you know make sure not to get bit Mm. Could, it can be very serious and three finger sloths they don't have the canine teeth that two finger sloths do and they also don't have the behavior of like i always say with two finger sloths they always bite first and ask questions later like immediately <laughs> they're they're out to murder and three finger sloths have a more varied personality like and this is of course with you know wild sloths like when we're rescuing them because even though we're rescuing them they don't know that we're there to help at least not right away so they're terrified thinking, you know, we've come there to eat them or whatever. So they try to defend themselves. And with three finger sloths, it's all with the, with the arms. They try to pinch and they have a death grip. I mean, like there's been, like if they grab onto you, you can't get them off until they want to get off. So there's been many times like they've grabbed onto a finger and we haven't been able to get them off of somebody's finger. And by the time you do it, you can't feel your finger anymore. Mm. Or sometimes for days, like the nerves are different for days. Like it's strong. Wow. <laughs> But they don't tend to bite as much. Like some three fingers will be a little bitey and we're like, ooh, okay, this one's a biter. But for the most <laughs> part, they're not, the three fingers aren't super bitey. But the two fingers always, always, always bite. Like you always have to, we always have to restrain the head first and make sure that that is controlled before we're able to, you know, get the arms and the legs whenever we're trying to rescue or do treatments on the two fingered sloth. So yeah, I mean, sloths can be, Extremely, actually, I have a scratch on my hand from a sloth. Oh my gosh, that's intense! I, yeah, I was like, I feel like one of those people in the movie where you like cut yourself, and you're like, ooh, like blood uh, handshake, yeah, <laughs> or you know, for some ritual or something because it's like exactly. a perfect little slice. <laughs> but, um, where's your ancient no, knife? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, it was, it was just from a sloth, it was just a sloth scratch. <laughs> so, yeah, we have to, you know, of, of course, sometimes there's accidents, but most of the time there isn't. Um, but we do, you know, there's a lot of training involved with properly handle, handling sloths. And that's actually one of the things we do with the local firefighters and local electric companies. We do trainings with their staff so that they can learn how to properly handle sloths because they're the ones that help us to save sloths before they're electrocuted by getting them off of the electric wires before they've been electrocuted. And it's a, it's a really important part of helping to protect them because we're able to save prevent about half the electrocutions that way. Wow. And if that happens, so a firefighter does need to rescue a sloth from these wires, are they then able just to put them on the next tree or or is it on a case by case basis or what what happens when this encounter goes down? So in our area what happens is they call us no matter the time of day or night. And oftentimes it's night because usually it's the two fingers that get on the wires and they're nocturnal. So we're on call literally 24 seven, but we come and we meet them and we get the sloth and then we do an exam, make sure the sloth is okay. You know, most of the time the sloths are okay and they just need to be relocated. Sometimes they did actually get a little electrocuted or maybe they have something else wrong with them. Like they're sick. Maybe they have mites or maybe they have old wounds of some kind. So sometimes we have to do treatments before they've been electrocuted, but usually they're okay and they just need to be relocated. And one of the things we found through our research, because we do do exams on every single sloth that has been on the wires or been electrocuted. And actually in Manuel Antonio in the past like three years, we have documented a total of 84 sloths that have been on the wires or been wow. electrocuted. 
in just in male Antonio. And in that, we've seen that the majority, vast majority of these sloths are ones that are young adults that are just like starting their lives. And so they're, they're already in search mode. They're dispersing from their natal territory, trying to figure out like where they're going to end up. And that's how they end up getting on these wires because they're, they're searching. They don't know. And in Mount Antonio, unfortunately, there's a ton of development and it's just getting more and more development every single day for tourism. And so that's how they end up getting on these electric wires because the forest is right next to the wires. And of course they don't really know the difference. So we make sure they're okay, and then we relocate them to a safe patch of forest away from the wires so that they can start their new life. And we also microchip all these sloths so that we know oh, if we're wow. getting the same ones back again. And only like 3.5% are the same sloth, or have we had, like, only like 3.5% have we had a sloth return. So if the vast majority are ones that are in that search mode. They're looking for a new territory, so relocating them works to get them away from the wires. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Because yeah, relocation for most other species does not work. So to hear that that is a, a good solution to that before they might need further care because they were on these wires, then mm -hmm. that is, that is incredible. Well, luckily with sloths, they're solitary. So, you know, they do have their own territories that they know and that they're used to. And I think that that's extremely important for them in knowing where to find food, because again, they need to conserve energy. So they don't need to waste a lot of time and energy looking for food. They need to already know where it is. And that's, a, that's what their mom teaches them for that time period that they're with them is, hey, this is, you know, this time of year, this is when the Inga is really yummy and tasty. And that's where you can get those leaves. Or, oh, this is the time of year when the mangoes are producing. And that's what the mom is kind of teaching them. But she's not teaching them what's safe to eat because they know inherently what's safe to eat. Like even the orphans. They're extremely picky. I call them Goldilocks because they would rather <laughs> starve. They would rather starve than eat a leaf that they don't want to eat. And, and that, that includes tr leaves from trees we know are safe to eat and that they would eat, that we're, we know are the right like age of leaf that they should eat. But they are so, 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 so picky, especially the three fingers. <laughs> so they have a very acquired taste. They know what they should eat and they know what they want to eat. It's just a matter of where is it and not wasting time finding it, not starving to death before they find the food that they need. So there is, you know, a small risk in relocating in that if it's not a good place with food, they might not find enough food right away. But in dispersal mode, they're already searching for a new place. So like we have a set, you know, location of like a bunch of different places within Mel Antonio where we can do releases that we know are safe and have the right trees and everything. And so we choose those locations for release so that they, you know, have the best chance of surviving. But like I was mentioning, since sloths are solitary, they don't need, you know, they don't have like a social structure that they need to maintain to be able to be released or to be relocated. Unlike with example for capucha monkeys, you can't just put capucha monkeys wherever you want. I mean, they would just murder each other. Like they're super mm. territorial and, you know, obviously they live in troops. So that's one of the nice things about working with sloths. And one reason why they are so releasable is because they are solitary. So you, you don't have to worry about the social structure as much. It's more, you know, does that area have the right food and safety and shelter and things that they need? Nice. And so how big is a territory? Is it like a, a tree or maybe like a small group of trees? Well, it definitely depends on the species and the age. So, for example, recently weaned three-fingered sloth territory is just a few trees. Like, it's very, very small. But a male two-finger, for example, is probably, their territory would be like a couple hectares, like two to three hectares, maybe even, could be even bigger if they, if they aren't finding what they need within a certain area. Because another thing with sloths is they... They do, you know, all try to choose the path of least resistance. So if they can find everything they need within a certain area that is smaller, they're probably going to choose that because, again, conserving energy. But, of course, the things that they need aren't just food. They also need to find other sloths. And so the males tend to kind of go into different females' territories to, you know, make other sloths. <laughs> and, and then the females, so the females generally between both species or both kinds have smaller territories than the males. And in general, it seems like the three fingers might have like smaller territories than the two fingers. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. What? 
I mean, I guess I don't actually know, but are three fingers bigger or like which which is the bigger species of the two? Two fingers are bigger. I mean, it's not okay. like a huge, it's not a huge difference. So the three fingers in Costa Rica, so it's different in, you know, South America and other countries, but in Costa Rica, three fingered, like adult three fingers sloth is between four, four and a half kilos. Maybe like a giant one might be like five kilos. And then a two fingered sloth, an adult is between five and six kilos. Probably once they're like fully, fully formed around like six kilos, because they seem definitely like the older, like the older females that have had like tons of babies seem to be the biggest, like they'll be like, for sure, like hands down at least six kilos or a little over six kilos. And like the longest, they'll be like 70 centimeters long. Cause we, you know, weigh and measure everybody that's in the two fingers. And so, yeah. So the two fingers are bigger than the three fingers, but it's not like a huge difference, mm. but the way that they mature and then wean is pretty different. So like the three fingers, the gestation in three fingers is about six to seven months, we think. And in two fingers, it's probably 10 to 11 months. So longer gestation than humans. Yeah. But with when it comes time to weaning, the three fingers tend to wean their babies between four and six months, and the two fingers wean their babies around a year. So by the time a three fingered has weaned a baby, it's about a kilo in size. So it has a lot more growing to do. Whereas when a two fingered weans a baby, they usually wean them around two and a half kilos. And so, I mean, they do still have a, a lot more growing to do, but they're still like way, you know, significantly bigger than the three fingers when they're weaned. So then do two fingers have more babies then just more frequency? Because normally that that's a correlation. No, the, the three fingers do. Oh yeah. yeah. So, the, right so the three fingers have babies like once every, like a little over a year, like maybe a year and a half and then, or like like just over a year. So like every 14 months or so, the three fingers tend to have babies and they do like, they stay knocked up. They either have a baby on them already <laughs> or they're already knocked up for the next one. So they definitely like pop them out. And then with the two fingers, of course, it's a little bit more delayed since they have a longer gestation and the baby stays with them longer. So with them, it's more like every two years to two and a half years that they pop a baby out. Wow. Oh, that's just like so cool. It's like going again down like their evolutionary just history and just how that those different types of child raising evolve in different species because like like mm -hmm. you said to us these look like very very similar species but that is a huge difference like mm -hmm. i want to stress this point like to have a complete different way of raising a sloth baby and like and like that reproductive method of like nurture versus you know number essentially and like wow that is, that is really cool. I had absolutely no idea. <laughs> it's so I mean, the cool. three fingered, the three fingered moms still do nurture a lot. Well, yeah, but, but you know what for, I mean. Duration. Just for a little bit less time. Yeah. The duration is definitely a little bit less for sure. It's right. about half. It's about half. So yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> a baby that's that, a significant difference. <laughs> yeah. A baby that's twice, maybe, you know, 150% bigger, like by the time yeah. it is away from its mom. I mean, that's just like so much further in life that it's going. But again, that means that mama can't have more babies. So it's always this trade-off of how many babies you're going to have versus how long are you going to nurture them until they're to like a bigger size. So exactly. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. That's so cool. So next, I think, I think the most next logical question then is what threats are they facing? What are you seeing now that sloths are going through and having to try to work through i feel like an easier question is what threats aren't they facing mm, <laughs> no mm -hmm. yeah i mean so one of the threats i like to talk about the most is the wildlife trade and the selfie trade because sloths are extremely susceptible to this because they are so popular so you know the popularity and the cuteness like with well actually it's this way the face yeah <laughs> um the cuteness that they inherently have of course, makes them very popular. And I know a lot of, you know, people that work with species that aren't as popular might envy working with a species that is popular. But honestly, I a lot of times wish that they weren't popular because it just creates a lot more headaches. And one of them is the wildlife trade. And they, you know, they're literally taken out of the wild for so many different reasons related to human entertainment. 
they, you know, there's a lot of different countries and Costa Rica included where sloths are used for, you know, to promote tourism. And it can be to physically have a sloth there to hold and take selfies with, which is of course like the worst. But there are some places that we think that are actually taking sloths and putting them in patches of forest so that they can take tourists around and call it like a nature walk and show them sloths like in the trees, which of course gets around the law. Because one of the good things about Costa Rica is that the laws here are much better than in a lot of other countries. Like there are laws preventing, there's actually, it's illegal to take selfies with wildlife here, which is amazing because there's so many places where it's totally legal, like the US, for example. And so it's amazing that those laws are in place, but it just means that, you know, the ways to get around the laws, people get smarter with it. So, you know, it can be putting sloths in little forests and having sloth forest. There's actually places called like sloth forest where, mm. you know, and I've like looked at some of these places. And I'm just like, okay, there's no way there'd be this number of sloths in this shitty ass forest. Sorry, right. I'm say shitty ass. You can um, say everything. Like, there's no <laughs> filter. Um, there's no way there'd be this many sloths in this shitty ass forest unless you put them here. I'm sorry. And it's isolated and whatever. But there's no way to prove that. Like, how are you going right. to prove that? So it's, it's kind of genius. I mean, I hate it, but it's kind of genius way to get around the law. And then there, you know, there's a lot of places that pretend to be rescue centers that just keep them in cages to, mm. so that they can show tourists. Luckily, the laws are like a little bit, you know, again, the laws are better here, but enforcement is hard. You know, it takes a lot of people to enforce things, but it's real easy to say, oh, well, it's not releasable. So I guess we have to keep it. And well, since we're keeping it, then we might as well show it to people. Make money. Yeah. So they're exploited a lot for money for tourism. They're also taken out of the wild and sold to countries like the U.S. Luckily, again, because Costa Rica does have such good wildlife laws. That part doesn't at least happen here so much anymore. But like, for example, for countries like French Guiana, it, mm. there, it's just like, there's like no rules keeping wildlife to, from being exported. So pretty much, you know, if there is a two-fingered sloth in the U.S. and it's a baby by itself, I can guarantee you someone bought it from someone who got it from French Guiana. And mm. it's... It's really horrible. And it's one of the things that actually pisses me off the most about like sloth encounters in the US. And a big, big red flag is if it's a baby without its mom, like ask them where the mom is. And I don't want to hear it was rescued or mom. If it's, if the mom's not at that facility, it wasn't rescued. It wasn't there. There was, you know, yes, moms can reject babies. Of course it can happen at any zoo. Right. And then, and then that's when, you know, vet techs and whoever have to step in and take care of the baby, but a responsible place is going to, okay, take care of the baby. And then, you know, keep it in the SSP and, and all of that. But if it's just like a random baby that came from a, a breeder in Florida or Texas, like it, it, came from the wild. Yeah. it came from the wild and, and that just keeps happening. And it happens at AZA accredited places too. It's not, really? even just the sh- it's not even just the shitty roadside places. Yeah. If it's a baby by itself and, and, and I've also heard some places talk about, oh, well we rescued it from somewhere in French Ghana. No, you didn't. Like, what kind of sense does that even make? Like, you rescue a sloth from French Ghana and then it needs to go to the States because, like, some random roadside place in the States is, like, where it needs to be rescued to go. So that's really frustrating. But, like, the whole, you know, wildlife and the, and then, of course, the pet trade. I mean, some, some places, some people don't even try and pretend like they're actually doing the sloth a favor. They're just like, I want one and why shouldn't I have mm. one? So I'm going to buy one. I mean, unfortunately, that is legal in many states in the u.s yep so some places don't even try and sugarcoat it and pretend like it's something that it's not which you know i guess at least they're doing that but so it's really it's really frustrating and it and it also is it's a good thing to point out because like i mentioned in the beginning the actions of people in america and in the uk and i'm not as familiar as what's happening in europe but i'm sure the similar kinds of things are happening there but the u.s does seem to be like you know, one of the countries that likes to exploit other countries the most. But anyway, so, you know, there is, there are actual things that people in the U.S. can do to help sloths in the wild, just not supporting unethical places in the U.S. You know, all you have to do is just say no, like just don't go to places that, you know, let you hold and and take pictures with and feed sloths, especially babies. Definitely if it's a baby, no. 
because they're, you know, they're supporting taking them from the wild. And there are like some zoos, like for example, like the Cincinnati Zoo, we have a good relationship with and like they work closely with the SSP. I think the key is like working closely with the SSP and making sure that, you know, the sloths have come from that community within the zoo and they're not coming straight from the wild. Like, I think that kind of thing is really important. Like I know the Philadelphia Zoo does the same thing. And I mean, there's other zoos that are doing it the right way, but it's just, I think, important as a tourist. What would you call it? Like someone who goes to a zoo, a tourist? What would you call someone who goes to a zoo? A visitor? Yeah, a visitor, yeah. Um, it's important to know that like, just because they're AZA accredited or just because they're a big name doesn't mean that, or just because they take care of other species really well, maybe. Like maybe they do wonderful things for certain species in the wild doesn't mean they're always doing the right thing for all the species or doing the right thing for sloths in particular, because obviously that's what I'm on a soapbox about right now. And so usually what I like tell people is ask like where they came from. If it's a baby by itself, huge red flag, uh -uh, abort. Like do not ever pay to hold and touch and take pictures of the baby. If they're not accredited, like, okay. Don't even, really, yeah. Don't <laughs> like, even bother because right. they're not doing anything right, you know. But at least, like, they need to be accredited. You need to know where the sloths came from. And the babies, you know, you need to see that they're actually trying to keep babies with their moms and not, you know, having encounters with babies because that's just, like, the ultimate red flag. Right. Yeah. So those are kind of the main things. And then of course, you know, not doing the obvious, like don't try to have one as a pet. I mean, I've gotten calls from multiple different, just like cat and dog veterinarians in the States that a baby sloth or juvenile sloth has come into their facility. And they're like, this is what's happening. These are their stats. These are their vitals. This is what their blood work looks like, blah, blah, blah. Like, is there any way to save them? And like, by then, of course, the sloth is in shock because most sloths, when they have started to show signs that they're very sick, it's too late. Because being like such a huge prey species, they don't want to show any sign of weakness in the wild. So they go a really, really long time before they show that they're even sick. So, I mean, just all these, you know, people who are getting sloths as pets, like the chance that they'll even survive with you any amount of time is super low. Like oh, you're not going to be able to feed them the right thing. Then you're not going to have the right climate for them. Like, and that doesn't even touch on whether they're happy or not. Of course, of course they're not happy. Right. But they're, they're definitely not healthy either. And yeah, it's really sad and it's really frustrating, but it is at least like something that people can do, you know, say no to these places. Don't get them as pets, that kind of thing. So <laughs> that was a long, a long explanation of my, I don't, I mean, none of the threats are good, but I guess the one that I get on the soapbox about the most, but then also of course, in Costa Rica and in everywhere that they're found. I mean, deforestation is the main problem for all wildlife. I mean, it's just, well, except maybe marine animals where plastic pollution may be the, but anyways, I'm not I'm a marine animal specialist, but deforestation hurts them too. But yeah, deforestation is for, by far the biggest problem for them because it just results in everything else. Deforestation is why they're getting electrocuted. Deforestation is why they're getting attacked by dogs. Deforestation is why they're getting hit by cars. So it's a huge problem and it's not stopping even in places like Costa Rica, where they do have really good laws for wildlife and they do have a lot more forest cover than in a country like Madagascar that I mentioned before, but the trees are still coming down. And in Mel Antonio, one of my biggest pet peeves, if you can call it is, so the view in Mel Antonio is really amazing because it's, it's where like the forest meets the sea and there's, you know, nice, I don't know if you'd call it mountains or just like big hills, but you know, it's very hilly right down into the ocean. Makes for a lot of strenuous walking when you're doing field work there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I kid. Yeah. But it also creates these really dramatic, amazing, beautiful views. And I get it. Views are nice. I, I do understand why views are nice. But in order to maintain views from every single room and every single hotel and every single like villa that someone has, they have to keep trimming the trees in front of that mm. room in order to keep that view. And just like a little bit of trimming can be harmful for sloths because if the trees don't connect anymore, then they can't get from one tree to the other as well because sloths don't jump. They're very flexible and they can stretch really far. So and they're really smart and really good about using their body weight as they move through the trees to like, they'll know like, okay, if I get on the tip of this, it's going to bring my body weight down and then I'll be able to connect to this other like branch. So they're 
really good at getting around, but there's only but so much they, you know, so many gaps they can cross. So just a little bit of trimming can create gaps that they can't cross. And then, you know, it's not, it's not always just a little bit trimming. Some, sometimes it's like ridiculously drastic trimming where it's like half the tree mm. or, or, I mean, or they're just taking whole trees out because, you know, of course the view is more important than the lives of the animals to a lot of people, sadly. So, so there's basically like large scale deforestation, like completely wiping out forests to build things that still happens. But there's also that little small scale deforestation that I think most people don't even think about because they're like, oh, it's just a trimming. Like what big of a deal can it be? The tree is still there, but it is, you know, still a problem and it's still affecting the ecosystem because even like, for example, trimming the tree can bring in a whole lot more sunlight in the tree. So even if the sloth can technically climb in the tree, well, they don't want to use it anymore because, you know, at 12 o'clock noon, it's too freaking hot to hang out in that tree now. Or, you know, the sun beating down on those leaves, uh, on those branches, you know, makes it harder for maybe like the leaves to grow or of course, and that's just like for sloths. I mean, of course, you know, what it does to insects and other creatures, like I can't even begin to fathom, but so yeah, so there's a lot of continual habitat destruction. And I feel like at this point in my career, that's probably like one of the things that gets me the most depressed. Cause it's like, all right, you know, we figured out how to rehab them. We figured out how to release them. Like we have amazing success rate with all that. But then it's like, all right, well then now where are we releasing them to? Like, is anywhere even safe? It feels like nowhere safe. And then, sorry, I'm like going. No, totally keep going. Keep going. I love it. Let's go. And then there's climate change. It's like, oh, fuck. Like, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> how even do if we figure this? out, all right, even if we figure out how to keep them from getting electrocuted, if we had a convince people not to murder the trees like oh well there's still climate change it's just going to create like a giant drought so then the trees are just going to die on their own because you know there's no water or i mean like a couple years ago it was a horrible dry season like Mm. super 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 dry where it did not rain at all at all and the food for the sloths in the in the trees was horrible and we know when the leaves are horrible up in the canopy besides seeing it but also you know, part of what we do in our rehabilitation process is obviously feed the sloths. And in order to feed the sloths, we have to collect that food from the wild to bring to them. And our, my team spends three to four hours every day doing that. Like it's a huge part of what we do, getting the right leaves. We get a variety of species. Like I think it's a huge part of why we're so successful in properly rehabilitating them. So back to climate change, when it's a, when it's the middle of dry season or even the middle of rainy season, if it's been extra rainy. So if it's too rainy or too dry, the leaves are horrible. Like they're just not, because they only eat the young tender leaves mm. or like the fruits and seeds and things like that. But all of that comes like seasonally, like it changes based on season, but it also changes based on, you know, rain and sun availability. And like the happy spot with trees is when there's rain and sun, that's when trees are happiest. That's what they need to like grow and all of that kind of, well, most of the trees in the rainforest at least. So when it was a really bad dry season, we ended up getting, I think it was like five juvenile two fingers needed to be rescued. And when I say juvenile, they were like, well, I guess technically they're grande babies. I call them grande babies. So they were not quite ready to be weaned, but also not like a tiny baby. So for two fingers, for example, I mentioned that they get weaned around two and a half kilos. So we were getting them in at like 1500 grams. And what I think, because they were just found alone, like it wasn't like the mom was found dead next to them or anything. Mm. They were just found alone. So what we were hypothesizing was that it was because the dry season was so bad that the moms were like, I don't have any more food for you. I'm (laughs) sorry. Like I'm not producing milk anymore. You need to, good luck. (laughs) Good luck. Yeah. Good luck to me too. I don't know what we're going to do. And I mean- Luckily with those kinds of cases, the rehab process is pretty easy and straightforward because the mom already did so much. So it's like an easy hand raising when they, they come in a little bit older, but it was definitely like a freakish wave of boom, 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 all these Mm. like babies. And yeah. So like, if that was some kind of foreshadowing of continuous climate change, I mean, sloths are fucked. I mean, all the wildlife are, we are too, but it's just... Like that kind of hovering over you when you're trying to like fight everything else is just like, are you even doing this? (laughs) Yeah, it's like, am I wasting my time? (laughs) Yeah, it's like I love you, but sometimes, yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. 
I know this all the time too. It's like trying to save all of these specific animals or like, like are the ones that we love so much. Then, then there's this overbearing arch of like, yeah, I could figure out how to mitigate human wildlife conflict, but if they don't even have a habitat because it's, you know, desertification is the real thing. All the habitat loss. It's like, yeah, damn it. Absolutely. <laughs> I know it's, it fucking sucks. And yeah. it like haunt, it haunts me. Like, I don't know. I feel like, <sighs> I used to and be a happy probably... person. I don't know how to ever find a happy anymore <laughs> because I'm like, there's always doom and gloom in my brain somewhere, you know, and whether you it's a specific case it... or. Yeah. And you probably see it more being in a tropical area as well, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it's, I would imagine the the differences are very stark. Like you said, like a dry season was just debilitating and like yeah. you had all of these babies that were a deserted by their mothers mm -hmm. because yeah. she had to save herself too. And so yeah. I can only imagine what that must feel like for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, with the constant, you know, reasons why sloths are getting injured or sloths getting orphaned, like trying to correct and mitigate those things, you know, is the, like the constant battle. I mean, I guess like for me, like I know that a lot of conservationists might not think that wildlife rescue and rehab is important in the grand scheme. And I, I do understand that way of thinking, like, you know, conservation biology is separate from rescue rehab. But I think for me personally, you know, the bigger picture and the individual animal is important. Like they're both important. And I think that with rescue and rehab and helping each individual animal, like, Sometimes that's, I mean, could be all we have. Like we, you know, no one's guaranteed tomorrow. <laughs> certainly the animals are, certainly the climate isn't, you know, our personal lives aren't guaranteed tomorrow, but if we can like continue to help on a daily basis, then at least we're like making a dent in this one area. And of course, improving their welfare, which I believe animal welfare is important as well, while still trying to fight for the bigger issues. But I feel like it's important that all of that is done, which is why the Sloth Institute, that's what we try, we try to do it all. You know, we, we do the rescue rehab for the individuals and we also work on the bigger issues at the same time, because I think they're both equally as important. And I think that the stories of the individual animals that we help and save help to give a voice to the populations in general, because it's a lot easier for someone to connect with, you know, one animal and their story and what happened to them and then understand the bigger issue because of what happened to them than just to try and talk about the bigger issue without any individual's stories to, to like bring the message home with. Right. Right. Cause yeah, talking about the greater species of sloth. It's like, yes, they are mm -hmm. in trouble and this is why, and this is why you should help. Well, not many mm -hmm. people are motivated. I mean, that's, right. the, that's the whole backstory of this podcast as well. It's like, stories connect you you get connected right. to somebody when you hear their story and it's the exact yeah. same thing and hearing your passion right now for sloths like <laughs> oh i want to do something my anger as well <laughs> <laughs> my passionate anger <laughs> yes it's two very similar emotions that's for sure but but and also too with this it's it, sometimes it's really easy to like oh well shit well what can i do and mm -hmm. there's something that I really want to, I want to go back to for a second, if we, if we wouldn't mind, um, since I'm a, I'm a, I guess you could call conservation travel specialist, like whatever, like that is what I decided to dedicate my career to was like sustainable travel for the purpose of conservation. Mm -hmm. And Costa Rica is definitely an emerging destination. And mm -hmm. with any new destination or anything that's, you know, up and coming, anybody can put a website together and be like, come visit me. This is why you need to spend your tourist dollars here. And it might be hard to suss out who's doing good and who's not. So from your ex you know, expertise, being there for many years, what should we as smart travelers be looking for as we're putting together an itinerary, as we are partnering with you know, organizations or operators that might put, bring us to these places? Mm -hmm. What are red flags? What are things that we should be looking for and maybe things to avoid. I mean, just anything as a consumer, I would love your tips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely an important question. Well, for a habitat country like Costa Rica, I mean, the ultimate red flag is 
how close are they letting you get to the wildlife? If they're letting you touch and hold and feed, absolutely not. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be an animal that's restrained in a cage for it to be bad. You know, just like, for example, if it's a hotel that feeds the monkeys, in Mount Antonio, that's a big problem is people will put out food for the monkeys, like capuchins and squirrel monkeys. You know, they're like, ooh, easy meal, some banana. I mean, I like banana too. I get it. It's tasty. So feeding monkeys is horrible. Obviously, it's bad for the species. I mean, like, you know, they shouldn't be eating a ton of banana. They need to eat a variety of things, but also encouraging the them to come to human spaces when that's where they get freaking injured that's where they get electrocuted that's where dogs attack them that's where they get run over by cars is horrible and so in general the biggest biggest red flag is anyone that lets you touch hold or feed and luckily again that is illegal in costa rica but that doesn't mean you know it's always enforced it it would be impossible to totally enforce it so it's up to you know the the tour operators and the hotels to to enforce that themselves so making sure they don't let you get t- too close to the animals or touch them or feed them in any way, not taking selfies with them, same thing. I mean, that goes hand in hand with touching and, and holding them. But then also, like, I would say even just looking at the property of the hotel might be, because, you know, you can ask them, you know, do you care about wildlife? I mean, I, I would think it would be rare that a hotel would say that they don't. Right. But just looking at the property, like, do the trees look over trimmed? Are, are they paying attention to the canopy coverage? Is there like a giant parking lot with nothing connected? There's like one newer place in Mount Antonio that calls itself eco friendly. And I'm like, you have the giantest, ugliest parking lot I've ever seen in my life. And that I know when that used to be trees because that's happened in the past nine years. And so I'm kind of like, mm, I don't know. Like, when you, when you, prioritize a parking lot over trees I don't think that you're very environmentally friendly I guess I would just say like don't take everything at face value and you know make sure you're looking at comparison places make sure that they don't just like say that they care but they actually you know exhibit that they care about wildlife so For sure, you know, that things are connected, that the forest, that they have forests, like they actually leave forest around them, you know, that's important, that they don't encourage touching or feeding or getting too close to wildlife, that they do, you know, encourage other bigger picture things like conserving water, which even though the rainforest does have a lot of water at times, of course, still conserving water is important, that, you know, all the typical things that we hear about, like with, you know, not overusing plastic and I mean, I think a lot of hotels are kind of already going that way. Costa Rica actually recently outlawed styrofoam. So like all of, all of the takeout places aren't allowed to have styrofoam anymore, which is super awesome Mm -hmm. because now, you know, when you go, you you get biodegradable material for your takeout and, you know, biodegradable straws and all that kind of stuff, which is super cool because those are kinds of things that as a consumer, like we try to, you know, avoid getting plastic straws and getting takeout that has styrofoam or whatever, but it's, it was, it's really one of those things that has to come from the top down. I think, I mean, the consumers are the ones that, that by, you know, making those choices and saying, this is something we care about the top decides to pay attention to, but the, but ultimately when it does come from the top down, that's when real change happens by them outlawing styrofoam. Like I haven't seen it since then. Like, it's pretty Mm. cool. Like it actually has worked even in little sodas, like little places, like everybody's following that rule. That's awesome. So that is one reason why it is important to be a responsible traveler because, you know, the government and the tour operators, they're paying attention. You know, if people keep asking for things that are actually ethical, that's what they're going to provide. And that is why it's important from the consumer, but the real change does come once, you know, the man or whoever, whatever it is you want to call the (laughs) people, the people on top, those The Jeff Bezos is like all the people (laughs) with all the money and the governments, they start to pay attention when enough people ask for the same thing. Are there some examples? So like, let's say, I I love that you brought a comparison. So what are some gold star hotels or tour operators or anything um, that you know of in Costa Rica that someone should at least look at their website and see why they're gold stars? And then as they're doing more research, then going from there and at least comparing that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't get out much. So (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, actually naming certain hotels. I mean, I, I should give a, a shout out to Tulumar since that's where we're located. Right. And, you know, they help to support us and do have some elements of, um, you know, taking care of the wildlife and like, they don't have any electric wires on their property. It's all underground. Oh, wow. I'm pretty sure that was done because to protect the view, but ultimately it, you know, win -win. is really good for the sloths. Yeah. Win-win. So I definitely have to give a shout out to them because, you know, especially Dave Hulk, he's great. I hope I said his last name right. We wouldn't exist without him and without Tulumar. So of course we're extremely appreciative of their support. Is he support. the owner of that property? He so Tulumar is actually owned by different owners. Like they have a bunch of different types of villas and houses that can be rented out for oh. holiday. And they were actually rated number one on TripAdvisor a couple of years ago. And just recently added to another like top 10 TripAdvisor. And when I say number one, I mean in the world. They were rated number one in the world on TripAdvisor. Yes. Whoa. So they're <laughs> legit, like well, for real. And damn. They, <laughs> they stay packed because of that. Because they really are, they do really provide like a wonderful service to the guests. And it is like a beautiful, gorgeous place. And that's one reason why sloths love to live there because there's a lot of amazing trees there. So yeah, so he is one of the main owners of Tulumar, but there are like multiple different owners. It's kind of confusing. They have like a homeowners association for all the different villas and stuff. But yeah, he's like our sloth savior. He's incredible. Wow. I know that also in Manuel Antonio, we have released sloths with Arena Del Mar. They seem to genuinely really care about the forest and the animals. And we've released sloths on Parador's property. They have a, a, a part, like anywhere that has like a part where they actually preserve it, like legitimately don't cut it or, you know, tear it down, I think is really important. Seacomano has a giant forest that they protect that they don't cut down, which is pretty cool. Those are the, I think Gaia has a giant forest that they protect that they don't cut down, which is pretty cool and important. Yeah. So I think any hotel that has like their own preserve is, is pretty awesome. Like it doesn't get much better than that because they are legitimately preserving that forest. They don't have to, it's their private property. They're saying you can't cut this or hurt this, you know, like we're not going to cut this and hurt this. That is a really good thing to look out for. All the, all the names I just said are some of the higher end hotels in Manuel Antonio. Obviously they can afford to have more land and, and protect that, but they still don't have to, you know, be protecting it the way that they do. So very appreciative of them protecting those private lands because, you know, in Manuel Antonio, there's the national park and it's wonderful. And it's, I, I'm pretty sure the most visited national park in all of Costa Rica, but it's also, I'm pretty sure the smallest, hmm. but it is also a, like Manuel Antonio is a biodiversity hotspot. There are so many species. I think the only part, I think the only national park that has more, you know, biodiversity packed in would be the Osa. The Osa Peninsula has, has more and Corcovado National Park is there. So that they might have more biodiversity than Mel Antonio, but that's probably the only one. And Mel Antonio is a lot more accessible. So a lot more tourists go to it and being smaller, like there's really, you know, like they've done a lot of work recently on, on making it handicap accessible actually, oh, which wow. is super cool. Yeah. The trails, you can have wheelchairs on trails and everything. So it is much more acceptable, I think, accessible than Corcovado though. Disclaimer, I have not been to Corcovado yet. Again, like I said, I don't get out much because I'm working constantly. I really want to go to Corcovado though because it yes. is so amazing. They have tapirs. I really want to see a wild tapir. Yeah, same. But yeah, so so that area does have more biodiversity than Mount Antonio, but that's, I'm pretty sure, I might be wrong, one of the only ones that does more so than Mount Antonio. It's, I mean, it's an amazing place. It's gorgeous. Like there's a reason why everybody wants to come there. It's fucking incredible. But like, it's not going to stay incredible if it continues to be degraded right and outside of the national park, none of the rest of the forest is protected. So it's all up to private people to protect it. Like there are besides next to waterways, there are essentially no rules. You can just cut down trees. You can trim trees. You can, you know, build this. And of course, you know, development is economically attractive. Right. Because, and especially, you know, I mean, Costa Rica took a huge hit as a country with COVID because tourism is such a right. big part mm -hmm. of the, you know, economy. So I understand, you know, developing and, and encouraging more tourists is good for the economy, but also, you know, as a wildlife conservationist, it just, it breaks my heart, honestly. Like I just can't, I just can't stand to see a tree cut or, or even, you know, drastically trimmed because I just know that that I know like it's negatively affecting the animals. Like there's no way it's not. 
it's just a matter of compromising and trying to be like, okay, well, it's negatively affecting the animals, but it's bringing in, you know, this amount of income to the area, but it's just, it's frustrating. Right. And it, and if somebody, I I guess also too, I, I really wanted to ask this. So how does your, like your establishment work is, is, can people come visit you? Is that like, like the city of the Manuel Antonio area or they're staying at Tulamar? Can they come visit you or, or how does that work on, from that standpoint? So our facilities where we rehabilitate the animals are not open to the public at all. And that's because that's what's in the best interest of the sloths. Like obviously they're, you know, we're rehabilitating to the release them to release them to the wild. Like I mentioned earlier, like that's the goal. There is no goal besides that. And, you know, exposing animals that are being rehabilitated to be released to lots of different people is, of course, you know, it should make sense, not the best thing for them because they're getting used to more people. And, you know, once they're released, we don't want them, you know, used to people. And it's also honestly just stressful. Like there's, it's, you know, I know that you, you said you used to be a zookeeper, like even, you know, animals that are permanently in captivity, like it can be stressful when too many people are around and noises and sounds and all those things. And you have to you know, design enclosures with that in mind. And, you know, even just like having the animals on display at a certain time of day, like might interrupt what they would actually be wanting to do, like sloths probably sleeping. (laughs) They can interrupt their sleep. So there's just nothing about showing, you know, rescued animals to people that is really in their best interest for ones that are going to be released. So we're not open to the public at all, facility-wise. What we do offer is called a sloth walk and it's a nature walk in the forest, uh, in the forested grounds around Tulumar looking for wild sloths. And also some of those sloths are ones that we've released and are now, you know, wild and a part of the forest and teaching people about what we do about the threats to sloth face, you know, all about sloth conservation. And it's really, and also of course, it's not just sloths that we find because there's three species of monkeys that, you know, live in Mel Antonio, of course, amazing variety of bird species there just within Tulumar, there's scarlet macaws and two Uh different kinds of toucans, parakeets, like, you know, really cool other mammals like agoutis. Oh, I love agoutis. They're so cute. So there's a lot of different animals that we show on this nature walk and teach people about wildlife conservation during that. Unfortunately, because the property is private property, it's Tulumar's property that is limited to Tulumar guests. So people would need to be staying at Tulumar to do the sloth walk, but it is amazing. I mean, people usually highly recommend it and it's a lot of fun for, and it's a, it's a great way for us to educate people because, you know, of course, during the walk, we talk about what it is to be a responsible tourist and, you know, not supporting places that let you get too close to the wildlife and all of that. And of course, it's a great way for us to receive donations since since we are 100% nonprofit, we rely solely on donations to to be able to save sloths and get them back into the wild. So it's kind of a win-win with that. Of course, we stopped doing those during COVID because we were, you know, on lockdown everywhere. But yeah, so the sloth walk is kind of the only thing we have. So unfortunately, we're not open to the public, but it's just what's in the best interest of the sloths. Yeah. And that's great to hear. That's great to hear. And just to hear that there also is something too, that people can possibly book and get to meet you and and everything. And also too, to possibly see rehabilitated sloths in the wild, like what's more special than that? You know, it's pretty cool. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, obviously, you know, they're wild and they're in the wild, but since we do track a lot of the sloths that we've released with tracking collars, if one of the sloths that we see on the walk has a collar, I mean, obviously we know their faces and what they look like, but even just guests who are staying at Tuller Mart might see a sloth with a collar. And it, that means it's one that's been in our program. We do track wild ones as well, because the whole like original study was to compare how wild sloths behave and what they eat in the wild with the ones that we've released to know that the released ones are doing well because they're, you know, behaving and eating the same things that the wild ones are. So some of the sloths with collars in Tulumar have uh, are ones that we didn't rehab that, you know, they're just wild ones. But yeah, like they're way up in the tree, but and wild, but yeah, they might be ones that we've released, which is pretty cool. And I mean, for me, obviously seeing the sloths that we've released happy and living and thriving in the wild and having babies is just like, 
Like that's what keeps Ultimate. me going. One hundred percent. That's the only reason why I have not gone crazy and, <laughs> and just quit is because you know sometimes there is the happy ending and um and actually getting to see it by tracking them and following them is just like the most incredibly rewarding thing ever. We have a sloth that we released a few years ago that she just had her second baby literally last week or like a week and a half ago. And oh, I adore her and seeing her with the baby and seeing how, what a good mom she is. I'm just like, wow, this is, yeah. Okay. I could die now. I'm happy. Like, yeah, this is like, it. Like, this is my life. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. You can only imagine how rewarding that must be for you. Just like you said, like they end up being almost like your surrogate babies <laughs> and then to see them having kiddos like it just mm -hmm. oh it must be so satisfying so next I want to give you a moment to talk about your book so oh, you have thanks. a book and mm -hmm. tell me all about it the title and what it's about and why in the world you decided on top of everything that you're doing to <laughs> write a book <laughs> well it's called sloth love and it is it's basically, it's a bunch of different, well, I'm a photographer as well. And so the, the crux of it is tons of sloth photos, including this one behind me hmm. and stories about sloth. So it's a lot of different stories about sloth, like the ones that I've worked with, rehabilitated and released, and then also a lot of different sloth facts. So the, the facts are coupled with the photos to kind of help explain the facts. And I mean, the reason why, I mean, I guess. I just feel, I mean, besides enjoying photography and enjoying writing, I continually want to get the message out about why sloths are special, why they're amazing, why we should help protect them. Because, you know, not, I mean, you know, not everybody knows. Like, I know that they're super popular right now, but that popularity can, can often be extremely shallow. You know, it's just, they're cute. Oh, and the sloths are so cute which is great. Like, okay, that starts the conversation, but it really needs to go beyond the cute or we're, you know, we're not going to get anywhere with their conservation. And so the goal with the book is to really help people connect through sloths by seeing them the way that I do. And there's been like a pretty good response from, from people, you know, especially from kids. Like it's so cute when kids write me and say they've read my book and they love sloths or they've learned this now because of it. It's, it's extremely rewarding to see, oh, okay, by using my voice, it's actually making a difference. Because again, you know, there can be days where I feel like, oh, am I even accomplishing anything? Am I helping anything? Like it feels overwhelmingly depressing. So, you know, books, I think, you know, are a great way to reach people and to continue to reach them because they read it over and over or, you know, share it with others. And Yeah. And I'm definitely working on some others as well. Ooh. So that's my first book, but it's not going to be my only book. <laughs> oh, girl. Mm -mm. And where can somebody <laughs> get it? So I actually, it used to be on, it used to be on Amazon. It used to be in Barnes and Noble and honestly any bookstore, but I think it might be on back order right now. I think my publishers have dropped the ball with that, with not making sure there's enough printed. But it should, I mean, any, any place where you buy books, I mean, it's been in every, I mean, it's been in like all the different bookstores. Like it was in Barnes and Noble, you know, local bookstores, support your local bookstores, good. <laughs> Amazon, but I think it's on back order on Amazon. So getting it actually uh, might be kind of hard right now, but people should stay tuned because like I said, there's more to come. Nice. Nice. That's good. That's good. And also too, if things are back order now, I mean, they're coming back. There's definitely been a supply chain issues with yeah. pretty much everything so unfortunately you have to be on the receiving end of that yeah but, you know we COVID all understand it a lot yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and I do I, I I'd love to ask this question as well just because you know so many people listening are in different parts of their career or might be experiencing something difficult right now from everything that you've gone through you have this incredible history of all the stuff that you've built and all these things that you've seen, what is one piece of advice that, or something that you've learned that you would really like to share with anyone listening? Like conservationists in general? Yeah. Just, just anything. Yeah. yeah. I think that the main thing I would say would be to find your passions and stick to them. Like find your niche follow your passion. Also 
like never be afraid to go the extra mile. Like, I mean, I think the main thing is, and I know there's a lot of talk about self-care these days and that is important, but I have to say like a lot of self-care kind of goes on the back burner to get (laughs) things done sometimes. So, I mean, not to say it should be like that always, but like, just kind of, you know, put your mind to it and say, I'm going to get this done no matter what it takes. And that seems to be a lot of times the only way to get things done. Like you just have to be relentless, relentless and passionate and, and also be in tune to what you really are passionate about and what you do enjoy doing and what, and your talents and like really, you know, think about it in different ways. Like, don't be afraid to think outside the box, you know? I mean, just because someone hasn't done it before, even if someone has done it before, doesn't mean you can't do it better. Right. So just <laughs> like, don't like just, and also I know I've heard this from a lot of people, but don't be afraid to fail because that's going to happen a lot. And I know that being afraid to fail has kept me from doing things maybe more quickly. Like there's, you know, tons of things on my to-do list. And some of them I like, I feel, I can tell I'm a little bit more hesitant to work on because I'm like, oh, I'm going to do a shitty job at that. Like, should I even try? And that's like a constant battle in my head. And, and yet, I mean, I have like, you know, had a lot of failures too, but like, I think having failures, it's just evidence that you're trying because, and that you're trying new things, new things to you. And so it's inevitable. You just kind of have to suck it up and be like, is failure really that bad? I mean, you know. It's just, it's a learning. It's part of the learning process. Yeah, you just learned a way to not do it. That's all. Exactly. (laughs) Like, all right, so that's not it. Let's try the other thing I was thinking. Yeah. Plan B. Plan B doesn't work. Plan C. Let's just keep going till we make it happen. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's awesome. So if someone's really connected with you and they want to support the Sloth Institute or help in some way, shape, or form, what should somebody do? get in contact with you or how, how they go Yeah. About that. I mean, so our website is the sloth institute.org. So definitely check out our website. We're going to be having a new website that Ooh. will be unveiled on international sloth day, which um, is what so, this is coming out for too. Exactly. Which is so, exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so by the time this is out, our new website will be out. So yeah, the sloth institute.org. So there'll be lots of information on there about how people can get involved. Obviously, you know, like I've mentioned before, we're nonprofit. So we rely a hundred percent on donations. So of course, you know, donating is important, but also, you know, if we do have volunteers and we have volunteers in Costa Rica, but also volunteers that help us from afar. So if you have a particular set of skills that you think could be useful, you know, shoot us an email. Maybe it is something that we will agree that we need. Because, I mean, volunteers are are donors as well. They just donate time instead of cash. I mean, some of our volunteers also donate cash, which is incredible. I don't know how these people exist. They're like unicorn, amazing humans. (laughs) But yeah, so again, like, you know, we... We exist as an organization to help sloths and we, but we wouldn't be able to do it with all the people that come together to make sure that we're able to do it from our volunteers to our donors. And so we always always encourage more help. Hmm. And if someone wants to get to connect with you, is the, is the website the best way to go about that? Yeah. Or I mean, my email, my email is sam at the sloth institute.org. So it's pretty easy. It's just my first name at the sloth institute.org. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Simple emails are the best. Yeah. Oh, great. And of course I'll have links to all this in the show notes as well and, and your social media and stuff. And then I would love to tag, you know, I always blast these out hard on social media. So I'll make sure that everything's tagged as well. So anybody, you'll be able to find these cute sloths, like (laughs) and support the Slot Institute, however you think you can, whether that's travel or staying at Tulamar or donating or just saying hi to Sam and asking questions. I mean, Mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. It's, It's all helpful. Yeah. We recently, I would like to say we recently started a TikTok. Oh, uh, nice, accounts. really. And so <laughs> if there's any TikTok users out there, we would love to get more people on our TikTok. We have about 5,000 followers now, which we're super excited about. But most of our followers are actually in Costa Rica because TikTok doesn't go, I don't know how the algorithm works, but it's all about like local following. But anyway, so yeah, 
to get the word out about our TikTok because yeah. we're producing some awesome video content. Just saying. <laughs> that is great. Yes, definitely gonna make sure we add that as well. I'm still trying to figure <laughs> out TikTok. I'm like, oh, I know I need to get I on know. there, but god damn it, I don't know what I'm I doing. I know. <laughs> I thought I felt that way at first too. I was like, oh God, not another one that I have to get on. But now that I'm on it, I'm like, oh, like I get it. I get why people like it. Like there's such a variety of videos to check out. Like it's not all just the mesmerizing dances, which they can be kind of mesmerizing. I get why people like those too, but (laughs) there is like genuine, like intense content. And of course our sloth content, Of course, but but yeah, it's cool. I I like, I like TikTok. Nice. I get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I I definitely got to get into it too, but also too, who doesn't want to see log on and that picture behind you right now, just, oh my God. Yeah, I think it's just to see that. Just I know, I have to like, figure feet. out which way to go <laughs> to show it the best. Yeah, yes. it's so precious. Yeah, so that's precious. probably my fo- most famous picture because it's gotten shared like a bazillion times and it's mm. um, been in a few Nat Geo books and stuff. But yeah, it's awesome. It's one of my favorites. I get it. It's a, it's a cute one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and I too, I would I would love to just, like since people are listening to this one and this is mostly an audio format, they'll probably be like, "What the hell are you talking about?" So yeah, if I can get it from you and I'll share it as well. Just be like, "This is Sam's photo. This is what we're talking about. This is one of mm-hmm. the cutest photos of all time. And this is why." <laughs> yep. Sure. Awesome, Sam. Well, this has been insanely fun, and I cannot wait to get this out for International Sloth Day and celebrate with you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been great chatting with you and chatting sloths and going on my soapboxes and ranting <laughs> about things. Thanks for letting me do that. It's cathartic. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.